Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the second episode of Children's Law Center's Community Conversation Series. Um, I'm going to dive right in. The pandemic is no doubt a crisis of historic proportions. It risks our health, our economic stability, and our emotional well being. But since we can't turn back time, I'm hoping that you will join us in embracing the oft, report, uh, oft repeated saying that within each crisis is an opportunity. And today we're gonna to talk about one of those opportunities. Experts have known for some time that children can't learn if they don't feel safe, that emotional well-being is a precondition or the foundation for academic success. But our schools and our classrooms have not really fully embraced this learning. In many ways, they ignore the reality of who their students are. We know that students in DC and around the country experience trauma at alarming rates and that children living in poverty, children with disabilities, and black and brown children experience the highest levels of trauma. And they carry that trauma like a heavy backpack into the school and the classroom. The pandemic has helped everyone to see that returning to school is a question of safety, which gives us a chance to convince schools to put students' emotional safety at the very center of the school experience before we talk about academics. We couldn't have a smarter, more thoughtful panel to discuss this issue with you today. All three panelists bring that important combination of expertise and experience. They are thinkers and they are doers. Before I turn the session over to Shara Greer, our policy director, who will introduce the rest of our panelists, I just want to just quickly explain our format. Um, Shara will lead a panel discussion, leaving time for brief, brief Q&A at the end. You can raise questions or comments by clicking the, the Q&A icon on the toolbar. Okay, Shara, I'm going to turn things over to you now. I think you can just start. Okay. Um, welcome everyone. It is my pleasure to be part of this community conversation and have with me uh, Dr. Deidre Bryant-Mallory and Marisa Perella. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with them for the last several years on school-based mental health and concerns about supporting students um, and, you know, just have the utmost respect for them. So we're so happy they agreed to, to be part of this panel. Um, Dr. Deidre Bryant-Mallory is the Senior Deputy Chief of Student Supports in the District of Columbia Public Schools. Um, she's had an over 20-year career in public sector service uh, in child serving roles. Uh, her work has largely been focused on school mental health with specific attention to the impact of trauma on school outcomes and introducing treatment progress monitoring as a component of educational planning. Um, she's a doctor of clinical psychology and a licensed psychotherapist. Um, Marisa Perella is a licensed clinical social worker and has been for nearly 20 years. Uh, she trained as a child therapist and in a postgraduate fellowship at the Yale Child Study Center focused on school-based mental health with an emphasis on trauma-informed care and Latino immigrant communities. She's the director of school-based mental health program at Mary Center, which partners with public and charter schools in Washington, DC to provide on-site behavioral health care using Mary Center social change model. Um, I'm gonna have each of them talk a little bit about their work um, to start things off. But before that, I wanted to just share briefly why this is such an important topic for Children's Law Center. Um, for over a decade, we have actually been focused on this work. We realized um, early on in our, our organization's um, history that one of the biggest barriers to success for our clients and their families was a lack of quality, timely mental health care. And that if we were going to truly get good outcomes for our clients and for their families and community, we needed to address that. And so we have been working on reform of the mental health services for children for the last decade. And a big part of that work and a priority has been focusing on expanding services in schools because we know how important it is to bring services to where children are and make it as easy as possible for students, children, families, youth to access those services. And schools are also seen often as a safe place and a trusted place um, and so it's another way to make it easier for families who might be hesitant about accessing services to feel comfortable in reaching out to be able to get necessary supports. Um, with that, I'm going to ask, I'll start off with you, uh, 
Dr. Dietra Brian Mallory to just talk a little bit about your your work in the program at DCPS. Sure. Just want to thank you, Shara and uh, Judith, for uh, the invitation to and and for my colleague Mar Marissa. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Deatra Bryant Mallory, and I am uh, the Senior Deputy Chief of the Student Supports Division at DCPS, which encompasses uh, school mental health, health services, uh, 504 discipline, uh, student placement when we have special circumstances that warrant a change in location for our students, as well as school culture. Work with some really fantastic, hardworking, and smart people. And uh, I, I may be biased uh, because I have served in DCPS for over 20 years, but I don't know another school district uh, in all of the travels that I have had across the country and talking to folks that are trying to figure this work out. I uh, don't know another school district that has made the kind of investments in school mental health uh, that DCPS has made. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I was a first grade teacher, uh, there was evidence that kids were experiencing uh, traumatic events, uh, but we didn't know what we could do to prevent re-traumatization, how to calm the brain, and we had no tested ways uh, on how to help children heal. And so I've had the opportunity over the last decade to dream really big for our students uh, in the development of an infrastructure that includes now 391 uh, clinically licensed social workers, school psychologists, and counselors. Uh, we've made investments in uh, gold standard treatments, uh, everything from grief and trauma to uh, play-based uh, therapeutic interventions uh, that are not just efficacious, but many have been tested for, spe for speci specifically for uh, uh, delivery in the school setting. And so really proud about that work and, and glad to be a part of this conversation today. And Marisa, can you talk about, about your, your program and, and Mary Center's work? Sure. It's a pleasure to be here with you ladies. I love seeing you. I get to see you quite often in this work. And I agree with Dr. Bryant Mallory that there are an incredible amount of brilliant people in the city trying to get this right for kids. Mm -hmm. um, Mary Center is a federally qualified health center uh, and our social change model really looks to address the whole child and family. And so when the school-based mental health program uh, was founded, uh, we noticed, and the reason it was founded is that we noticed that our children weren't really presenting themselves to our clinics in the ways we needed them to, to receive that full episode of treatment for their mental health condition. And we knew that as part of their progress uh, for their physical health and their well-being, that they needed that support. And so we were very lucky to find partners in the school system um, by speaking directly and making relationships with principals and mental health teams that they, we saw that they did need us in the schools um, and that partnering with them directly was really removing this barrier to care and really reducing the stigma of having a mental health professional involved. And so by directly partnering with these mental health teams, we now have access and collaboration in the school setting to not only provide these evidence-based practices and treatments to children, but also to expand that to their families, to support teachers, um, and to bring those families into additional types of care at Mary Center. So any educational programs, workforce development for families, um, social services, behavioral health. And when you start to expand those services to families, you start to see better outcomes for kids, which, which, which we all know. We all know that um, supporting families supports children. So that's what we're doing through our program. And fortunately, the city has really invested in that, in that program, and is now supporting many more organizations like Mary Center to be committed to school systems to give them that supplemental care that they need. Yeah. Thank you. And, and you both touched on this a little bit in, in, your, in your opening remarks, but I wondered if you could go a little bit further in grounding us and talking about what mental health means for students um, and why it's so important to talk about when we're talking about students feeling safe in the context of schools and learning. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go first? 
I'm, I'm happy to. Uh, I think you all touched on it when we opened. I think, you know, kids learn best in safe and predictable environments uh, where they can be affirmed, where they can be free to develop and experience success and make mistakes. Um, physical and psychological safety is sort of critical and it's also the thing that we're struggling with the most right now as we um, battle with this pandemic that has uh, shaken all of us. Uh, this is the reason why school mental health is so important at this particular time. You know, I, I think this time is really, um, I'm sorry, can I be, is it okay if I speak, Shara? Yeah, no, go ahead. I was going to say, Marisa, do you okay. add? So please I go ahead. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I, I think um, this time is really telling for adults who work with children. Um, we say all the time that children, we know from the brain science that children need their energy to learn. And if their energy is constantly, if their brain focus and energy is constantly scanning their environment for safety and security and threat, that their brains aren't available to learn. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've learned as adults right now, being in this kind of threatening and scary environment is we, we really see that to be true. Imagine all of us when COVID first hit, we were scared. We, we, were, we couldn't focus, I bet. I bet many adults in, our, in your lives weren't able to focus on, on what they needed to do until they were able to secure their physical safety, their families, their work, their um, economic stability, their food. And until you can do that, your brain can't be available to do the work. Um, and so adults have been, really the world has been put in the position of understanding what it might be like to be a child in school who feels threatened all the time because of the trauma that they've experienced. So again, back to this um, opportunity that a crisis can bring, it can really bring adults into a place of understanding. Um, but it also brings us a special responsibility, and that is to be fully cognizant and aware of supporting our teachers, our administrators, our front desk receptionists, our security guards. Everyone who works in a school is experiencing some form of, of impact or trauma based due to what's going on in our, in our world, in our city. And so we have to support them and give them a stable base so that they can support our students and make them feel safe. Mm -hmm. Well, and as you mentioned, this has been a particularly traumatic time for, for you know, pretty much everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that, that, you know, children are not a monolith and don't all respond the same to different traumas. Um, and same thing, Marisa, as you mentioned, you know, parents, families, mm -hmm. school personnel are all also experiencing trauma um, and they're experiencing it differently. Mm -hmm. um, can you share some of the ways you've seen the children and families you work with being impacted yeah. Um, mm -hmm. in the last few months? Sure. Um, I think first, you know, for some students, and I would say probably students who don't have the same kind, do not live with the same types of vulnerable circumstances, like they may have home security, food security, economic security. I think for some of those students, they've been okay. Um, they've missed their peers. Um, some might even be doing better, removing some of the stressors of school. I think unfortunately what we've seen is for many children and unfortunately many children of color who may be living in circumstances that are more vulnerable, like not having food security, not having stable internet, not having enough technology, um, they are not doing as well because their families are busy securing their base. And so some of these students are feeling highly anxious. And these are students who we were seeing anyway for issues of anxiety for, that they brought before COVID. Um, they are feeling, I think, stigmatized um, by their families, maybe have, having family members who've contracted COVID, maybe because their family members have to go to work. They're first responders. Uh, they work in grocery stores. They need to go to work to earn money to buy food. Um, so we've seen a lot of, of fear, the same kinds of fear we actually saw during the immigration raids when children were afraid to leave their parents. Um, because they were afraid they might get deported for some of our undocumented community. So that fear, that not wanting to leave your parent worried about them. Um, we're seeing a lot of challenges with our LGBTQ youth who um, school is a safer haven for them to be where they can be themselves with their peers and families who are not accepting of their identity. Um, they're feeling not quite, not as safe being home with their, with their families. So that's just, that's just a, a a little bit of what we've seen. There's a lot more, but I'll let I'll let Dr. Bryant Malley speak to some more of that. 
Yeah, I, I think you're spot on, Marisa, and please call me Deidre. <laughs> okay, um, Deidre. <laughs> uh, you know, I, we, are, we have seen uh, similar things, and, and DCPS actually invited families through a learning from home survey uh, during this distance learning period. Uh, and we asked them some, some pointed questions, and we were pretty, I was even pretty shocked at some of the results. Um, above food, above shelter, above health care, um, mental health support was endorsed as the greatest need during this time. And I think it speaks to how the pandemic has affected, uh, you know, every socioeconomic uh, level. Uh, and then in a follow-up question, we asked our families uh, if they had concerns about their students' social emotional well-being. And 61% of our families expressed some level of concern. Now, most of those concerns were slightly or somewhat concerned, but there were some folks that had some pretty significant concerns. And the fact that 61% presented a concern, had concerns at all, is really quite telling about how this has affected people. Mm -hmm. I think for us too, like parents are the experts and we know, you know, parents know when they are experiencing or seeing changes in their child. And so we've taken that feedback very seriously and thank goodness, um, you know, this moment in time did not catch us without some foundation for supporting mental wellness, but we are taking this feedback that we've gotten to extend uh, the work that we're doing as a result. Now, the three of us have been working together and our organizations have been working together uh, for several years um, and most closely on the school-based mental health coordinating council trying to move forward uh, a program to expand mental health services in all the schools across the city. Um, and prior to the hit of the pandemic, uh, we were actually really hitting a stride um, in the second year of expansion and really going much more smoothly and getting ready to expand into year three, hopefully by year four, actually expanding into all four schools. Um, and then we had some significant challenges. Um, we went from a place of having a large budget surplus in DC to having huge budget deficits, which has made expansion much more complicated. And that's the debate that's currently going on right now. Mm -hmm. But also students left the building um, and so to continue to provide those supports became more challenging, like had to be done in a different way. And so there had to be a pivot across the board into how to continue to provide supports. Um, so what, what have your programs been doing this spring to provide supports to students and their families? And how do you see that evolving over the summer? Well, I have been blown away this spring by the creativity and ingenuity that staff, both teachers and uh, school mental health staff as well, have been using during this period. Um, I've seen clinicians creating challenges uh, to get their kids involved and staying connected with their groups, uh, using music and poetry to engage students. Uh, and the district gave a considerable amount of technology out to uh, students, hotspots and different kinds of devices so that they could access uh, the curriculum and access their service providers during this time. We also received, I mean, the, the outpouring of support from the private community uh, can't be understated as well. We have had uh, both Giant and Safeway, if we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, basic needs coming first, um, food and shelter. We've had Giant and Safeway to uh, give gift cards away to homeless families. We've given away donations in the thousands uh, for um, food, for transportation, uh, Lyft, uh, the the what are you, what, what is Lyft? They are, uh, the, the other company- Ride share. <laughs> ride share, ride share, there we go. <laughs> ride share programs, Lyft, uh, they donated $5,000 to us so we could get families to and from safety if they needed to change locations for living, if they needed to get to food sites, things like that. Those are things that are just, uh, you know, have been so wonderful to see people uh, pour out support in that way. 
And then we have our community mental health providers like Mary Center, who have been out front and center too, providing mental health support to students. And almost 800 students uh, were served during the closure by our uh, community-based mental health uh, providers uh, alone. So it has been, a lot of support has been given. Uh, all of it has been greatly appreciated by our families. And we uh, continue to do a lot of that work uh, during the summer as well. Yeah, I would echo a lot of what Dietra said. Um, I feel fortunate that Mary's Center has been able to also raise over $75,000 in direct cash assistance for families. That is giving families money uh, to support what they need to buy. Um, we've also got laptop donations out to people. Um, and I would say that equally, Dietra, the, the clinicians and their creativity has been amazing. And so I, I, mm -hmm. I of course, this is such a tragedy what's happening, but the, the ingenuity that comes out of that is phenomenal. And so one of the things that has been stark to me and in, in, re, in realizing is that we can reach a lot of families virtually. As soon as, you know, when we get them the technology and they're set up to do that, many of the reasons we had a hard time reaching families was maybe parents with structure, timing, room capacity. When you remove that and you hold, say, a parent virtual support group to talk about resources in the community, emotional supports, how to support your children, you can bring together up to 50 parents meeting each other from different schools. And that has been, for me, like a light bulb and a game changer. And probably things, some of these things will never, will never go away for us in some capacity, um, is being able to reach even more families in a way and, and sharing our resources among schools. Um, some of the other things we've learned, and I think we learned it from one of your surveys, Dietra, was that kids want to, teenagers want Instagram Live to get their information. That's how they get their information. So we've had a really good time playing with Instagram Live and really reaching students that way. And it's been, it's been a lot of fun. And again, it's probably something that we will continue to do even when we go back um, to the in-person work. So uh, we have uh, Twitter yeah. chats, uh, Twitter, Twitter chats, and in Instagram <laughs> lives. Yeah, it's been pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, and really, we've also just done a lot of re outreach to families. We recognize that mental health supports cannot be traditional in the way they used to be. Just calling and having your regular mental health session, although we do that as much as we can, but we do just a lot of calling and checking in on families. Um, because we know that they need that. They need someone to say, to, to just check in um, because they may not be able to remember their appointment or think about it at that moment, but they're really happy to hear from us. And I will tell you as a parent of DCPS children, it really was nice to receive calls from my children's schools. And DCPS did a phenomenal job early on making sure parents knew that they were there and the kids knew they were there. So I, I really want to shout out um, that amazing, amazing early, especially early on, really responding to the crisis. Yeah. Well, and I just want to echo that. I mean, I will say it was uh, the response from our, our colleague partners at the Department of Healthcare Finance in changing the rules so that mm -hmm. healthcare could be provided virtually pretty instantaneously yes. mm -hmm. was remarkable. Yeah. Um, and um, there were efforts across the city to get technology to families, which I think has really helped mm -hmm. us. And it has really exciting. And, and I do think that a lot of the changes that healthcare finance put into place to allow virtual delivery of services are going to stay. Um, I, I will point out just for folks who are listening, um, we did put Children's Law Center put together in the first couple of weeks of the pandemic, a list of who, who made that pivot quickly. Um, we've kept it up to date. So if you need to know like what schools are still providing virtual services, uh, who do you contact to get those virtual services? What community-based organizations can, are still accepting new patients virtually? Um, you can find that um, in the, the COVID response section of our website. Um, so if you, if you or someone you know needs to, to find a resource, um, that's, that's available. Mm -hmm. um, I do want, uh, I know we, need, we want to have time for, for questions, but I do want to at least touch on just give you a chance to, to touch on a few specific challenges that you expect, expect to face in the fall as school reopens. I know that's something on many people's minds, especially all the parents' minds. Mm -hmm. At DCPS, we have uh, made a commitment to focus on routines, resilience, and relationships. 
And I think by doing so, we tackle uh, some of the things that we know are going to present as challenges for our young people, for the little person that won't be able to give their, uh, their teacher a hug. Um, that's going to be very different. And so how do we find ways to strengthen relationships uh, in new and different ways? And so, you know, we have uh, put out several strategies uh, to teachers and to schools that we'd like for them to really lean into that will set us up for success in establishing new ways to create routines, new ways to create community, new ways to establish relationships. One example that comes to mind to me right now is uh, something called the two by 10, uh, which is spending time with a student uh, two days a week for 10 minutes about nothing that is instructional, uh, but simply spending time talking about just how they're doing, what's going on in your, you know, in your life right now, and establishing relationships in that way that are separate and apart from your assignment, separate and apart from any skill building um, requirement, but just about building relational trust. And so that is the kind of uh, work that we are really, really leaning into. We've also introduced the trauma responsive schools model that has five non-negotiables uh, for schools, for every building uh, at every school in DCPS. Uh, and I'll share two of the, just for the sake of time, two of the non-negotiables are to identify uh, ways to establish wellness and self-care for staff. You know, is there an action plan for every staff member that you can support uh, them in their own wellness journey? And another is um, building relational trust. So spending dedicated time with each student in your classroom. So routines, relationships, and resilience uh, is, is how we plan to address some of the differences and the nuances that are going to present to us as opportunities. We'll call them uh, opportunities to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to get to know our kids and to support them uh, differently uh, and even better than we have before. I think Deidre said a lot uh, of what I was thinking, and but I would kind of just add to that that as providers, um, you know, we do some of this work that Deidre's talking about with um, supporting teachers and supporting staff and creating an environment that is safe. But we also see a lot of the children in our practice who um, who really need extra mental health support. Um, and always will. And these might be students who have a more difficult time reading social cues. And so I think about those children and how they're going to respond to teachers who are wearing masks when we're losing 50% of the communication by the mask. Um, and how we can support them and work with them individually on understanding, you know, accepting social cues in different ways. Um, and I also think a lot about parents and their own anxieties about letting go of their children and sending them off to school. Although some might be thrilled <laughs> to have their children be back at school, I think some are gonna feel some level of anxiety which will transmit to their children. And so really working on rituals for them to separate and to get into a different kind of normal. Families are used to being together and for our youngest children, that separation might come back. And so working with parents really and strengthening their ability to do that is kind of what I'm worried about, but also um, feel is very, very important work that we're going to be, be thinking about moving forward. Um, and I think for our teenagers, you know, one of the challenges is, is they really need structure and a place to be and parents worry about their teenagers because we know that teenagers during out of school time is, is when they sort of are uh, experience those challenging behaviors that we worry about like substance abuse and, and such. So the um, having some kind of hybrid schedule, I think is may also going to be a challenge, um, tracking where your teenager is and what they're doing and who they're with uh, for physical safety reasons, as well as emotional safety. But again, all of this I think is an opportunity to leverage our work on social media um, and to work and to really strengthen our relationships with parents, which we've been able to do during this time when many of our parents are around and are able to touch base with us by phone and by video. So we look forward to some of that. All right, 
Well, I think we should open it up to questions from the from the uh, from the audience. Yeah. Um, thank you, three, and thank you to all of our um, audience members and for some great questions we have coming in. Um, one I wanted to start with. Um, so in addition to the pandemic and the economic downturn, we're now seeing racial injustices that have obviously been around forever, but are more illuminated now. Um, I know that many kids are experiencing the underlying trauma caused by seeing violence in the news or social media um, or within their own communities or through participating in protests themselves. Um, how can we address those issues with our kids? Marisa, did you want to start first or would you like for me to? I will defer to you and then I can add to that, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I think the, the killing of black people should be hard for all of us to accept. Um, but there is great opportunity again here as well. Um, there's opp opportunity to lean into some of the generational injustices and find ways to help in tangible and meaningful ways. Um, a few things that I can think of are teaching children about the contributions of Black people. That sounds so simple, but I think that uh, when you know people or you learn about people that look different from what the media has uh, painted, uh, then you get to appreciate those people differently and better. So be a part of creating a new narrative um, for your children. Um, I also think talking about what's happening is really important. Uh, there are lots of resources out there right now that uh, are all about, you know, how to talk to your child about social justice and how to talk to your child about implicit bias and how to talk to your child about the George Floyd uh, case. And so there is no shortage of uh, tip sheets and things like that to help uh, strengthen the self-efficacy of parents to know like you can do this, you can have these conversations, um, you will get through it and uh, your family, your children uh, will be all the better for it. And so uh, I did share uh, with uh, Hannah and the Children's Law Center team uh, a few resources from the uh, Anti-Defamation League, uh, and from the uh, Harvard um, Developing Child Center. Uh, I think there are some resources in both of those places that uh, might be helpful to families that want to have those conversations. And apologies for my, my dog. <laughs> we decided that there was something interesting outside the door. Um, this, <laughs> The, uh, the killings and the protests and the uprising have really um, given pause, I think, to mental health professionals. And we've been digging in as a team into um, mental health therapy in and of itself being very white-centered. And so we're doing a lot of studying and work this summer on thinking about mental health intervention and sort of the decolonization of that. And that has been a difficult but really important process. And I think if you start, if we can start really looking into ourselves and why we're here with these children, why we've made this choice to work with children and families in the city, children and families of color and not of color, and really thinking that through and approaching every situation, every intervention, remembering that that is the legacy of mental health therapy. It was, it was founded um, from, through white culture. And so that, that process in and of itself, we hope is gonna provide a lot of reflection and support and improvement in the way we approach children and families. And then I just wanna say that if you've not watched Van Jones and Elmo on CNN, I would like everybody watching this webinar to tune in um, if you are worried about, or thinking about how to speak with small children about, about race and racism. It's, it's really wonderful. And it is an inc incredible to me how many rich resources are out there now um, and how much time can be spent watching and viewing and learning. So I'm, I'm encouraging everyone to sort of pace themselves on this issue because it's, it shouldn't go away, it's not going away. It's always been with us, but, but we can't react in such a way that we then tire of it and move on because we can't move on. We have to keep it on the forefront of, of everything we do. It is not a separate issue. It should be a, 
uh, an integrated issue that we metabolize in every way that we approach our reopening of schools from staff to parents to therapy to children and everyone so um yeah yeah and, I appreciate, and, and teacher i appreciate you sending over the resources um i i'll defer to hannah i know we're going to post those on our website and i think they're also going to be made available to the audience during the session because we anticipated that that was likely going to be a, a question because it is so much on everyone's mind these days yeah, and I'll, I'll share that great list. Thank you, Deidre, um, sure. in the chat shortly. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. Um, are there practices that have been developed to protect students' emotional health during the pandemic um, that have been successful and could be implemented in the post-pandemic world? Hmm. Um, one that we have been uh, leaning into pretty intently is mindfulness. Um, mindfulness practice uh, has a way of calming the brain. Uh, it has a way of uh, releasing uh, anxiety. Uh, and it is something that when we first started in this work, we were not sure how, uh, you know, kids in, in urban settings would, would respond to uh, those kinds of practices, but they have gravitated to it and have loved it very much. Um, we are also uh, developing uh, our tool belt in the area of emotional freedom techniques or tapping. And tapping is also something that uh, is a stress reliever, is a calming uh, activity uh, that could be used very easily at any given time. And so I, I will, will leave those two things. There are apps uh, on tapping uh, and there are great YouTube uh, videos on tapping as well. And we've used both of those interventions and, and many others. And I would say that one of the, the pieces that has stood out to us with small children has been that a lot of our work with children is, is, is through play and that children heal through play and we know that and that many children don't have the kinds of toys I think that play that play in our offices can bring to kids, can, can allow children to sort of explore their emotions um, because many kids just don't have, they have more electronic toys in their homes. And so we are exploring ways of trying to get those young children at least a basic kit of puppets and toys that we use in therapy to allow them to sort of express some of their anxiety because uh, we see magic happen when kids play with guidance from, from clinicians. So that, that's an area that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And I realize this is not exactly the same thing, but as, as, was, as I mentioned earlier, I think um, making sure that telehealth continues to be available mm -hmm. um, and that people are able to access resources. Because I, I have heard, in addition to what Marisa said, a lot of um, really positive feedback from families and, and um, and youth that it, it has made it much easier for them to be able to stay connected. And that's really important mm -hmm. right now. And even when they go back, if they go back to school in the building mm -hmm. uh, full time, even then that's gonna be really important because um, mm -hmm. it can be a lot more convenient um, mm -hmm. for a lot of families to be able to, to access the services that way. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We we plan and we, to be honest, Mary Center always has utilized telehealth and we've used it as a supplemental um, intervention for parents who work many hours or are unable to do that. We've used it. We've, we've FaceTimed parents into sessions in schools to connect them with their children and show them some of the things they've maybe made in school. And so we've always used it, which really helped us to, to really pivot really quickly and plug that in. I think we're concerned about the families who don't feel quite as good about it. They don't like it. It doesn't feel right. Their houses are small. They don't have privacy. So we're trying to get creative about ways of still being able to reach those families because we think they still really need that that support and they need they know they need it. But they're just finding they're finding a struggle and really connecting with it. So working on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, Judith, we're going to turn it back over to you for um, to wrap us up for the day. And thank you to the three of you for the the really informative conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks, Hannah and Dietra and Shara. Thank you, Dietra and Marisa. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Um, okay, I think I'm, I think I'm on. Uh, thank you, Shara Marisa Dietra. That was just wonderful. Um, um, I wanted to raise up a few of the points that you made. I was really struck by some of the comments about getting food, um, getting food and cash to families and how part of emotional health is feeling safe with food security and housing security. So just wanted to, to put that out there that part, when we think of emotional health, we often think of therapy, but you talked so much about the, the underpinnings of that. Um, but then interesting that folks who have the wherewithal to actually fill out a survey, Dietra, mm -hmm. that in DCPS said that mental health was the most important thing. So that once you get some of that security underneath you, the very next thing folks were focused on. And that's the experience we had. Um, you know, Children's Law Center represents thousands of kids. And we reached out to every one of them at the beginning of the pandemic. And we wanted to talk about school. But for so many of our families, before they could focus on their kids' education, they needed help figuring out food and medication and some of those mm -hmm. really basics. Mm -hmm. At that point, we could then help um, connect them. Yeah. Um, um, but on the positive side, um, it sounds like one of the most, the biggest takeaways is that we're going to stay virtual for a while, even when we can be back together. Um, and that that will be a way that families who have a hard time with transportation and some who are holding two jobs down to try and support their families will be able to participate in school and their children's mental health. Mm -hmm. What I think, um, I just wanted to raise up two other things that um, I think are important before we close. One is that there is a painful lack of specifics when you guys talk about what it's gonna look like. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the reality that the anxiety I am sitting here feeling, and I am sure many of us who are parents or grandparents feel is, wait, but you actually didn't tell me exactly how it's gonna work. And I just wanted to acknowledge that so many good people are working hard to get that ready. And yet we don't know the answer. <laughs> Is my child going to be in school or at home? And, and when you say routine and relationships, it sounds good. And I'm glad that's the underpinning. But exactly what does that mean? So I just yeah. wanted to acknowledge that reality that you guys are working so hard. And yet it's going to be a little while. And like our kids, we're going to experience that anxiety. Um, and then the final point I wanted to make before I um, sort of wrapped it up is um, my experience has not been quite as good with the school system, I won't say what school or whether it's a charter or DCPS, in terms of engagement. And I think that um, the groundwork that schools laid paid off, or the groundwork that they didn't lay hurt in the pandemic. And I'm proud of Children's Law Center's role in making sure that there was a wonderful foundation in the cohort that has school-based mental health programs. And that one of the great successes is where we have all successfully as a community laid the groundwork for parent engagement and for mental health services, schools were able to pivot faster. And in those schools which didn't have it, maybe things didn't look as good. So um, it is about the work we've done with healthcare finance on telehealth in the past that allowed them to pivot. And so as Executive Director of Children's Law Center, I just have to say I'm proud of our role in that and really um, impressed with the partnership we've been able to have with all of you. So I just want to close, obviously this is a topic of huge importance and it is not going away. We're all going to be talking about it all summer and into the school year. Um, for those of you in the audience, I want to urge you to keep um, yourselves as part of our conversation. You may email me or call me with ideas as I think we know this is, some, uh, this is a hard problem to solve and we need everybody's thoughts on it and good minds. So the larger the group of people, the better off we are. Um, in addition to that, I think there are several other ways we can keep the conversation going. As Shara mentioned, um, Children's Law Center called literally every children's mental health provider in the city and compiled a resource list that's available on our website, um, along with lots of other resources about managing during the pandemic. We will put Dietra's list on our website as well. Um, please feel free to use it yourself or to share it with anybody you want. Um, if you are a lawyer, you may have a little extra time this summer to attend one of our trainings, um, or you may be all ready to take a case. Our kids and families need you, and I know that we have um, cases available right now. Um, and last but not least, certainly not least, we can't do this work without the generous support of um, so many people in the community. So 
is someone said, if you can't fight, fund. Um, we would love mm -hmm. to have your donations. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to close us out, um, I want to announce that our next community conversation is already being scheduled. Uh, we don't have a date yet, but we do have the topic and it's telehealth and telemedicine. And we already have our panelists, which will include Karen Dale, who is the head of AmeriHealth Caritas DC, the largest MCO in the city, and Melissa Bird, who's DC's Medicaid director. Um, I know right now a few of our speakers need to sign off, but we are gonna keep the Zoom open for just a few more minutes um, in case you have questions or comments. So we are open to the audience to participate a little bit more, even as our panelists may have to sign off. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks again. And folks, if, if you're still there, feel free to keep dropping questions in the Q&A box. Like Judith mentioned, we can, we can hang on for a couple more minutes. Um, one, one that we've seen, um, a, a bit of a lighthearted one to end out. Um, what is one of the most encouraging things the two of you have kind of experienced or maybe with working with our clients or um, in your work with our policy program, Shara? Um, mm -hmm. what, what, have, what is something hopeful you've seen? Um, I, I think it's mm -hmm. <laughs> a tough one right now. Uh, I, mean, I think when when Marisa and, and Dietro were still on, they sort of touched on it, which is there was a pretty fast pivot. And because there had been good groundwork laid in a lot of, of schools, a lot of families were able to stay connected um, and be connected. Um, and there have been some really good work. I mean, what we do know is for some schools, their outreach and support of families has been remarkable. And in other schools, it's been really disappointing. And, and, and so the, the, the bright spot is that there are lots of schools that are doing really well in supporting their students' men, mental health. Um, I, I wish it was universal and not so mixed and not so school by school. Um, but there are some really good things happening. And there are a lot of people who are really focused on this work. Um, and I do know that, um, you know, as I mentioned in the very beginning, there's a challenge about the continued expansion of mental health in schools, um, but there's been a lot of focus and attention by the council to try and make sure that that, that, that work continues. Yeah, and I think the, I mean, Deetra is saying that relationships are at the heart of things. Um, I think she's always known that, but I think we're seeing that more and more schools are beginning to actually understand that learning only happens when you have the underpinnings of safety. So the experience, the experience of all of us being unsafe in the pandemic has actually helped to educate more people. And I think that itself is a really wonderful thing. Um, also, the groundwork that we've laid has paid off. So when there is capacity, it has really worked. And, and that, I think, um, is, an, is, a, is a positive moment. Um, so I actually am quite optimistic that this will help to change what education looks like. Um, and I think that is probably a good place to end for the, for the panel. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and thank you to Shara and Judith and to all of our attendees um, and had a, have a good afternoon.